this is a synopsis of the letter that Lloyd wrote to the Western Australian newspaper on October the 24th, 2015. So it's after all the main events. And he had been going to give an interview and he decided instead to send this letter. Of course, bear in mind, he writes a certain way because of his profession, possibly. And, you know, I think he chooses his words very carefully. And a letter such as this, it's just like any memoir, isn't it? it it's a memoir, so it's still not reliable as the truth. It's not to say I'm saying that Lloyd has lied about specific things in this letter. And, you know, he's saying that it is his truth and he is making it as a statement of um, what happened, what he knows, what he believes, I guess, how he feels. Uh, it still comes under the umbrella of memoir, if you ask me. So, you know, because of course there's, there's this, that and the, the truth. So Lloyd's letter, so at the time of writing the letter, he was 53, and he was actually a little bit older than um, Corinne. She was 44 when she died. Um, so she, if she had lived, would have been um, 51. So yeah, I think he's a couple of years older. He talks about being educated at Trinity College. This would be something that he'd be very proud of. Um, he he um, graduated in, um, from the Tasmanian University there in 85 uh, and went into public prosecution in WA, Perth in 1986. He worked various jobs, and we know that he made an unsuccessful bid um, to be the Deputy Public Prosecutor of WA um, in 2003 before he moved to Bermuda. But from 2005, when he returned, he was working for Francis Burt, and that's where he was working when Corinne went missing. So he met Corinne in 86, they started dating in 87, and their marriage was on the 17th of March, 1990. Caitlin was born on the 21st of March, 94, and as I said before, she's, she's now reading the bar at Oxford University. And Sarah was born 9th of February, 97, and is reading law in England as well. Lloyd goes on to write about how he was walking on eggshells with Corinne and even around family and friends, they could witness that she was verbally rude to him and that he would not retaliate. He says, and I would not retaliate. He says he tried to keep the peace and that Corinne wanted to be free. And when he refused to provide her with details of finances for his practice, which he believed she wasn't entitled to, um, such as, you know, things like client names, um, and she was unsuccessful in, with that subpoena, um, she then asked him to leave the family home and it then just became a verbal battlefield. So you've got the situation where at home the children are witnessing arguments and just this really bad blood. Now he's saying it's a, it's, um, sorry, um, he's saying that she was verbally rude and aggressive to him, but that it wasn't a battlefield. So you've got this situation where 
without hearing from the daughters, is this really true? What did they know about their parents' marriage? Um, you can't really tell if when others weren't there, did Lloyd, did he retaliate? Um, or is it the fact that he, maybe because he didn't ever fight, because he never wanted to have these conversations or go there, was it just so ultimately frustrating for Corinne and on top of everything else? And was the way that he managed the stress of that or, you know, the dis his disapproval of having too many um, commitments asked of him, I guess, is that why he started gambling? I, I don't know. Um, so he says it's never a, a battlefield, but um, he says that it was only Corinne that raised her voice. So this is what I find interesting. In early July 2007, so the month leading up to um, Corinne being murdered uh, at the parent-teacher meeting, to Sarah's teacher, Corinne announces that they're separated. Now, did Lloyd really not know this? Did Corinne have to find this way of telling Lloyd, you know, in front of a witness and with someone and in a situation whereby she felt safe to say or, yeah, able to say it, something she hadn't been able to maybe in private or, you know, on their own? It's quite bizarre. Or is he completely... Is he just deluded and he didn't, he honestly didn't realize that this was his situation? Or is he being, um, you know, ingenuous about this? So, something about July, I'm going to tell you about later, and we're going to talk about that in the next video. The other possible suspects, and a little bit about the police and their investigation. So he says the separation announced that night. It's news to him. Then on the 6th of August, the day before Corinne's disappearance, Caitlin asks to go to Gwen Stefani. Um, the concert being held at the, the stadium in the city. This is only the night before. So did the friend have a ticket for someone else and they were unable to go? Did Lloyd somehow arrange for Caitlin to be going to this concert? Or, you know, did she really ask? I, I would love to know more about it. Um, I'm also trying to find out what time the concert did actually finish that night. I guess because a lot of the audience would be pre-teens and teen um, Gwen Stefani, of course, um, being popular to that age group, both boys and girls probably, uh, it probably didn't start late or finish late. So, following night on August the 7th, Caitlin, the elder girl, is at the concert with her friend and the friend's mother is chaperone and Lloyd's home with Sarah and Corinne goes to her boot scooting. She regularly did this. Lloyd in his letter said she was in a good mood when she left at 7.30 and they had the agreement that she would be back um, and at 9.30 they would discuss the end of their marriage. Shana, the friend's mother, dropped Caitlin at 10.30 to 10.45. I wish that was more exact. And Shana and the friend were invited in and they refused. He states, Corinne didn't come home. It pissed him off, but it wasn't for the first time. He called her office twice the next day, left messages, um... The police claim they didn't retain these messages. Uh, and Lloyd says, well, I did leave these messages. The police just didn't retain them as evidence. And this is consistent uh, in their behavior to pick and choose the evidence. 
when Lloyd left his office, actually, his colleague just said, um, he said, I have to go, something's come up. He didn't say, you know, Corin's missing or anything like that. He just, he got up leaving saying, look, some, something's, something's happened, I have to go. So Lloyd went to Corinne's office because they had called to say she's not here. And he saw that a photo of him and the two daughters was on her desk and it moved him that it was still there. He says he made many calls. Um, he mentions that Corinne's family were already distant toward him prior to the disappearance. Um, and it's so weird because he says in this letter, he says, well, this isn't surprising because we were separated um, and in the process of divorcing. So what? So just from July to August, he, he makes it sound like, by saying there was distance between him and Corinne's family prior, doesn't that sound like, you know, it's sort of six months, a year, you know, of distance. So has he called himself out here a little bit? Because in July... This is apparently when Lloyd first finds out that they're separated and they're divorcing and all the rigmarole is going on to do with, you know, trying to gain financial records and things like that. Um, so what was a false statement that he didn't know that they were separated? In fact, he knew for a long time, uh, but he was just trying to act sort of cook holded or something um, or you know or used or treated badly was it a way of showing that he thinks he's treated badly by Corinne just dropping that bombshell in the way that he did um, I'm sure to a man like Lloyd it was humiliating and if indeed it really was a shock that he didn't realize that there wasn't a chance to maybe save the marriage uh, it would have been uh, very distressing. I can imagine how I would have felt if that's how things had maybe happened to me in a relationship, right? Can't you put yourself in each of these situations? So, but that's what he, what he says. He says, this was not surprising because we were separated and in the process of divorcing. I could not see, they thought I killed Corinne. Um, he goes on to talk about how, you know, the police had his whole entire house bugged, that they spared no expense in um, the investigation against him. Uh, police came and went as they pleased. There was no search warrant. They, they just camped out. And indeed, remember when he did take his daughters overseas, uh, the few months after um, Corinne was killed, uh, they swarmed his house when he wasn't there with warrants. Uh, when they arrested him, they made sure the media arrested him for the bugging allegations. They made sure the media were at, at his house. They they knocked on his doors several times when he, when he didn't... Um, uh, come out yeah they basically kicked the door in and brought him out and he was he was dressed in his uh, double-breasted gray suit and um, yeah they made a huge spectacle of the arrest of course at the time media wouldn't have known what he was being arrested for <laughs> so he says they just spoke to to him and the girls numerous times they were officially interviewed uh the one time um but i guess like in the more few case you know he just had agents on him all the time and they were continually talking with him and recording him right so yeah that arrest um 
he said he was suspecting it was going to happen um, because of their, you know, the way the police were acting. Um, you know, even when he went overseas to Thailand with the girls, uh, he says there were agents there. That, that was so obvious. They were at his hotel room. They were following him. Um, they were being trailed. He says it was just truly bizarre. Um, on the day Corinne was found, a neighbour states that a gold car turned up to his house, a big guy with gloves went through his garden for 15 minutes, collecting or planting evidence says Lloyd, and we're going to talk about what this may have been later. And the neighbour was frightened. But then another neighbour actually at another juncture says, Lloyd seemed frightened when in conversation she mentioned that she did have um, security on the front of her house, but that it didn't have video, he seemed to visibly relax. I don't know. He said his... Arrest in 2010 was done for maximum humiliation and distress and for obviously maximum uh, media attention. So Corinne's work was at the Supreme Court in Barrack Street, Perth. It's a very busy street. So opposite the Supreme Court, um, this is where... Lloyd was arrested on the 8th of December 2010. So police alerted the media. They arrested him in the street and he was made uh, by armed police and he was made to stand in public for a very long time. Um, he did spend 16 days in prison. Uh, he was put in with the sexual predators with informers, he was strip searched re regularly. Um, he goes on in this letter to say, I recorded conversations with Corinne because of her insinuations against me. I wanted to, I wanted a record of the lies um, and Corinne was aware, he states that Corinne was aware of the recordings. The dictaphone was visible to both of us each time uh, we spoke in person and he thought acknowledgements from Corinne about untruths would protect him, I guess, throughout the divorce. He goes on to say, despite her beauty and her gentle demeanour, Corinne was formidable, a strong character, tough as nails. I only saw her cry once. She was, and that was it when her mother died. She was dominant in our partnership, determined and fearless. She didn't care less about the recordings. I think he should say, couldn't help cared less about the recordings. And yeah, the, the insinuations that he was most worried about came on the 13th of July. Isn't that interesting um, that he slept in his daughter's beds? Um, I taped the police now, and then he went on to tape police. I taped the police because it was... It, it was becoming clear they had they'd charged me they'd charged me with murder. I knew many people in WA wrongly convicted. This would be because of his role as a barrister. I knew many people in WA wrongly convicted as a result of police conduct or misconduct, I guess, fabricating evidence, planting evidence, and misrepresenting evidence. Um, he goes on to say, Caitlin said bluntly, if something happens to me, no one will be there to look after her and Sarah. 
That's weird, eh? Enormous pressure and stress. He can't sleep, he says. Um, so much trauma. He's lost his appetite. He's lost his concentration. His memory suffers. Suffered his con confidence. His whole demeanor. His appearance. He, he's got depression. Difficult to cook and clean and get out of bed. He fears for his safety. Um, you know, so spending tens of thousands, $10,000 in total on state-of-the-art cameras and security for his home inside and out. Um, you know, for a long time he was sleeping on a mattress outside the girls' bedrooms. You know, he just really, really um, lived in fear. So that's Lloyd's letter to the Western Australia. Uh, when we come back, let's talk through, uh, I guess, some of the police investigation and who might have actually have been capable of the crime. Um, people truly believe, and, and people of high standing, there are people that support Lloyd and believe that he couldn't possibly have murdered Corinne. And there's a piece of evidence that a forensics professional um, says makes her believe 100% that it was impossible for Lloyd to have done it. And I will add, in the way that um, police state, all right, so I'll see you soon.